Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. In today's video I want to give you a brief introduction to the finite element method and not delve too much into mathematical operators and formulas, but keep it very simple. So let's jump right into the agenda. I want to give you a brief overview of the historical background of the finite element method and how it all began. Then we will jump to what the finite element method is, how do we use it and how does it help us, what is the so-called divide and conquer approach, we will mathematically derive the equations for the finite element method and talk about boundary conditions. Last but not least, we will talk briefly about element types. So basically all began with the so-called baristo chrome problem with Galilei in 1638 and he mentioned in his last work that the sphere will go faster from A to B following a curvature which is under the effect of gravity. Then Bernoulli came in 1696, who was one of the fathers of variational calculus, and he presented this problem in his 15th version in Leipzig, in the so-called Acta Eruditorum, and this was one of the first scientific journals ever. And he tackled this problem because he was a little bit in, into competition with his brother Jacob. In 1697 we have Leibniz coming up with his first draft of discrete variational method with element-wise triangular shape functions. We will discuss shape functions in a future video and not delve too much into shape functions in this basic introduction. Lagrange 1755, who laid a solid foundation for the finite element method, where he basically took an optimal solution, perturbed it by an arbitrary variation and called it delta y, which we later on call test function. Schellbach came in 1851 with some analytical studies on this variational problem or problems. Then Rayleigh followed 1877, who did some numerical analysis on these problems. We have Ritz coming up in 1908, who proposes and analyzes approximate solution based on linear combinations of simple functions. And he solves two difficult problems of his time. He solved the linear elastic Kirchhoff plate problem with a variational method. And the main motivation of Ritz at that time was the announcement of the Prix Vaillant, 1907, by the Academy of Science in Paris. Courant, in 1943, introduced triangular and rectangular finite elements for the 2D saint venot torsion problem. So jumping to 1956, we have the first finite element paper released by Turner, Clough, Martin and Top. And in case you want to have a look at that, you can see the title in the bottom right corner. In 1965, we have the NASA project and they issued a request to start a development for a structure analysis tool, which we call Nastran. Some of you might know it, it's very famous. Two years later, the first FEM book was released by Dr. Zinkiewicz, and he simply called it the finite element method. In 1968, we have the term isoparametric mapping popping up. So Zinkiewicz and some colleagues introduced isoparametric mapping for quadrilateral elements. This will also be covered in a future video and not discussed in this basic introduction. In 1970, people could combine 1D and 3D theory in the same mathematical modeling. Two years later, we have the first mathematical paper on the finite element method by Babushka and Aziz. And beforehand, no uniqueness and convergence has been proven so far. And on the right hand side, you can see one of the fathers of the finite element method, the famous Gilbert Strang. Five years later, we have the first professional finite element P version code called Fiesta. Five years later, a P version FEA software tool called Probe for aerospace applications was developed. In 1991, people were discussing and developing model hierarchies where we have separate errors of discretization and idealization, which is basically essential for verification and the validation as well as the uncertainty quantification. And we have a finite element book as well coming out from Chabot and Babushka. We jump right to 2006, where the American Society of Mechanical Engineers released a guide for verification and validation in computational solid mechanics. Two years later, NASA released the standard for models and simulation. This standard consists, consisted of two parts, and you can read a bit about it by pausing the video or simply downloading the slides. And in 2013, we have the world's first cloud-based simulation platform called SimScale. So what is the finite element method? Some of you might have heard this term before, or other terms like finite volume method, finite difference method, as well as spectral method. These are all computational methods or techniques developed by engineers to solve a problem, but always in an approximate manner. 
So this is a model and we want to approximate the real world by using these models or these methods or techniques. Nature can usually be described by partial differential equations, short PDEs, and nature is continuous. So we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom and we want to make it discrete. We want to have a finite amount of values that we know and that we can actually solve. So we go from the partial differential equations to the system of linear equations which our computer can solve. And with today's power available, we can solve very large systems. Please note that this is always an iterative process. I will talk about the iteration in a few moments. So why do we use the final element method? Here you can see an example of a crash simulation with Legos took from Dynamo. And if you imagine now that you have this crash test and you have to use real cars that would be very inefficient in terms of costs and it would be very time consuming. So what engineers do is they have, they use only a few prototypes and not create a lot of them. They simulate before how the real world behavior will look like in simulation tools. So how does the final element method help us? So at the beginning you have this, you have the design. So you have your CAD model. That's how we usually call the design or the, the file you created. In the usual cycle, you create a prototype, test it, redesign it, and then build it. And this, these three points in the middle usually take a lot of time, money. What we basically want to have is a tool that allows us to take these points and put everything inside of, com of a computer, which then solves the problem for us. So what is the divide and conquer approach? Imagine you have on the right hand side a rectangle and you discretize this rectangle by subdividing it into smaller pieces. This so-called discretization of this bigger part into smaller parts is called a mesh and the mesh consists of these small elements. So where does the name come from? A finite element is a small piece of structures. So we don't have an infinite amount of elements, we have a finite fixed amount of elements that we want to tackle the problem with and then solve this problem by using these finite amount of elements. We often talk about nodes and these nodes basically fasten the elements together. Short recap, so continuum, if you have an infinite number of degrees of freedom we talk about a continuum, a continuous medium. If we have a discretized model we have a finite amount of degrees of freedom and not infinite amount. So what are the steps involved in the divide and conquer approach or in the finite element simulation in general? Step one would of course be like to discretize the continuum which would be the divide and conquer approach I have just shown you. Then we select the so-called interpolation functions. We find the element properties in the third step, assemble the equations in step four, solve the global system of equations in step five, and in step six we compute additional results like stress, strain, displacement, etc. Having an example now for the divide and conquer approach, you can see a rod with a temperature distribution of T of X. And we want to chop this rod into little pieces, as can be seen right here. And if we put it together now, you can see that we have piecewise continuous temperature distributions. We know the values at some points, we prescribe them. And in between, we use so-called shape functions to determine how the interpolation in between will look like. I mean, if we compare this temperature distribution with that one, it looks quite good, but not perfect. What we could think about is to use a quadratic or even cubic polynomial as a shape function to even approximate this temperature distribution better. Here we can see a structure and to have a finite element representation, we chop it into pieces. Here now as an example we have three elements and four nodes. If we take in 1D axially loaded bar, we have the following properties with the length L, the Young's modulus E, and a cross-sectional area A. Now we take this element and want to derive the stiffness matrix. Don't be overwhelmed. You can pause here and have a look at the equations. I will go through them step by step and not too fast. The first equation we will have a look at is the equilibrium condition. This basically tells us that F1 plus F2 equals zero. So everything is in equilibrium. Then we have another famous formula that you might know from engineering mechanics. We have sigma equals Young's modulus times Epsilon. And Epsilon is defined as the difference of 
displacements, so delta u, divided by L. This is the start configuration. Now we have the force, which is defined as area times, or cross-sectional area times stress. And you might know that stress is force times area. We have just rewritten it in the terms of force. So force equals cross-sectional area times stress. And stress can be substituted by E times epsilon. And epsilon can be substituted again by delta U divided by L. Please note that the small e that you can see above the uh, sigma, for instance, means element-wise. I also could have written a small e above the epsilon and the U and L but I've left it, left it out at that place. So we keep this equation in mind, and now we want to be a little bit more precise. We say that delta u is u2 minus u1. And then we can say that the force is k, k is the stiffness now, which is def defined as a times e divided by l. And we substitute this with k. So we say k times u2 minus u1. And if we take into account the equilibrium, like f1, as we said, f1 plus f2 equals 0, and then say f1 equals just minus f2, the force 1, or minus force 2, is k times u1 minus u2. It's very simple mathematics. If you don't understand it right now, no worries, you can pause the video or write down in the comment section. I can give you some tips, tricks, and maybe show you some examples in the future if you want. I would be happy to help you. So just let me know. So we have the rod here again. We write down the equation that we have had in the last slide. We can rewrite this whole expression as can be seen below for F1 and F2 respectively. If we want to write this in a bit more convenient way, we can use matrix vector notation as can be seen here. So if we calculate everything on the right hand side, we will get exactly the same two formulas on the left hand side. This is just for convenience. And very important to note here is that the stiffness matrix, so A times E divided by L, which is a constant in this case, let's say, times this 1, minus 1, minus 1, and 1 matrix, this is the stiffness matrix, and that this 1 matrix is symmetric, as you can see. It's singular, so it's non-invertible. And that's very important to know, because if we take the system like this, and would give the system or our element um, a force, it would just float around in the universe without doing anything. And in order to overcome this problem, we need boundary conditions. And for boundary conditions, we make the system determined. Then we, have, then we have the displacement force following after our stiffness matrix, so U1, U2, and the force F1 and F2. We can write it even more compact in a well-known form as you might have seen already in your lectures, k times u equals f. That's a very famous formula. And if you want to get the displacements, you usually say, okay, we invert the k matrix. And note, I say invert. For that, the k matrix has to be invertible to get the displacements. So here we have a local formulation now. This is the local formulation for one rod. If you want to have it in a global formulation, so for the global assembly, you get this four times four matrix. And why is that? Usually the number of nodes defines the dimension of the stiffness matrix. And this too emerges from the fact that the elements are connected or glued together at one point. And this two is nothing else than a one plus one. So one one comes from the first element's stiffness matrix. And the second one comes from the second element going into the stiffness matrix. The same happens between element two and element three. And you can also see at the position three three in the matrix, there's another two. If we now talk about boundary conditions a bit, we have to talk about the so-called Dirichlet boundary condition. And this basically means that we say, we take something that we know and put it into our system of equations. In this case, the rod is fixed at the wall. This means that it cannot move. This means that u1 equals zero in this case. That means that every entry related with u1 will be zero anyway, multiplied by u1, and will not affect the global system at all. This reduces the complexity. We have a natural boundary condition, also a Neumann boundary condition. I will talk about in a few moments what this is. This is basically the force. So we say Neumann boundary condition, we know the force, which is in our case F4. At the fourth node, we have a force applied called P, 
and that's what we know. Going to element types, we have one, two and 3D elements as can be seen below. If you want to have a closer look at them, you can pause the video or download the slides from my Patreon page. You can also see that some elements have additional nodes in between and what that means will be covered in a future lecture. So stay tuned. Some examples of elements can be seen right here. If we take a sand buggy, like the structure of a sand buggy, this can basically be modeled by 1D elements. And 1D elements are two nodes. These two nodes are connected by a straight line. You can use these elements, as I've just mentioned, for long and slender structures with a constant cross-section. Then we have 2D elements, where we have one small dimension and two larger dimensions, which is also used for shells and plates if we want to simulate them. And then we have 3D elements where all geometric definitions are included. We have volume elements and these elements usually have three translational degrees of freedom, but you have to take care. Not the element has three translational degrees of freedom, but the nodes of the element. Each has three translational degrees of freedom and no rotational degrees of freedom. Talking about the boundary conditions again. So we have Peter Gustav Lejean Dirichlet coming up with the so-called Dirichlet boundary condition. And what is that? This specifies the value that a solution needs to take on along the boundary of the domain. We also say that theta of x is theta dash of x. You don't have to pay too much attention for the mathematics, it's just for the sake of completeness. Karl Neumann came up with the naming of this boundary condition, the Neumann boundary condition, where we have the derivative of the solution, which also goes into the equation. So we have q times the normal vector n, and we have the mixed boundary condition, which mixes the both we have just mentioned, also called Robin boundary condition, defined first by Victor Gustave Robin. And in case of structural simulation, we would have a Robin boundary, a Robin boundary condition would be elastic bedding as can be seen below. Having some examples. So if we take the first row for the finite element method, a Dirichlet boundary condition would be a displacement, a Neumann boundary condition would be something like imposed strain or stress, or an external load as we have seen for the rod. Robin boundary condition, also we have just seen it, is something like an elastic bedding. For CFD, stands for computational fluid dynamics, we have the following. Dirichlet boundary condition is velocity and or pressure, which is prescribed. For Neumann, we have du by dn is equal to zero, which is something like a symmetry plane. For the Robin boundary condition, we have a semi-reflective wall, which is often used for pressure-based models. And last but not least, we have thermodynamics, where the Dirichlet boundary condition is if we prescribe a fixed temperature at a point, imagine you have the rod and you want to prescribe a temperature at the end and on the other end. We have a Neumann boundary condition, which is something like the heat flux. And we have, as a Robin boundary condition, the convection. And the convection gives us a linear relation between the heat flux, for instance, from the difference from a specific temperature point to a reference value. So that's it so far some topics that we will cover in upcoming videos and I want to know from you down in the comment section what we want to discuss in the next videos. We have the following topics that can be chosen. What is a mesh? Talking about errors that you can make in a finite element analysis. What is a linear simulation versus what is a non-linear simulation? And we will also talk about here why the world is non-linear and why you shouldn't use linear all the time. What are singularities? Sounds fancy, I know, but it's also a very important topic. How does the workflow of a FE analysis look like? And closely related to that, how do you optimally manage FEM projects? How can we use Paraview for FEM processing? For that, I've thought about doing a simulation Sunday, where we can take some easy examples or some advanced ones and do some simulations using SimScale. Practical applications that I've just mentioned, Simulation Sunday, for instance, and we'll talk about very important concepts that you need to know about to become a finite element expert, like the hourglass effect, shear locking, what is shear locking, and many more. As I mentioned, if you have any ideas from your side, please put them down in the comment section. I would be happy to answer you and put these points that you mentioned on my to-do list. Also, you feel free to vote for some of the points I've just mentioned. would be happy to see what you think would be an awesome topic for the next video. This slide I have just shown you can be downloaded from my Patreon page, so everyone who supports me will get every material that I use in future videos. And depending on what tier you choose, we can have a one-on-one, 
chill hangout session if you want to have advice, career advice, or anything like that. If you have any ideas for, if you want to become a patron and have ideas what I can serve you with, please let me know and we'll make it happen. With that being said, please like the video, share it with your friends and share it with those who might benefit from it. Give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and make sure to keep engineering your mind. See you in the next one. Oh, 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 oh,